Hello everyone, my name is Patrick King. I'm a fourth year bioinformatics student at the University of Calgary. And this is my Second Life alter ego, Pathogen Monocular. I've been working on the Second Life team with the University of Calgary's uh, iGEM project this summer, and I'm putting together a video to show you what it is I've been up to all summer. So I've been working on the BioBricks simulator. It's meant to be a learning tool for students who are new to iGEM. And the idea is that we will take all these molecules that exist in the cell and represent them all in Second Life and implement their behaviors and see if we can teach students this way by getting them to play with these molecules before they actually have to work with them in real life. So this green sphere is meant to be an RNA polymerase. It's fully interactive with, or fully movable in 3D. You can drag it around. Same with this piece of DNA over here. This is meant to be a biobrick device. For those of you familiar with BioBricks and the Registry of Standard Biological Parts, you'll recognize the color scheme. If not, I'd encourage you to go and check out www.igem.org and uh, just to gain some basic familiar familiarity with what's going on here. So the green region is meant to be a promoter, a promoter. That's an RNA polymerase binding site on DNA. The purple region is an MR indicates the mRNA transcript to be produced, and the terminator region is at the end in red, which is where translation stops. The interaction of translation is very easy to start in the simulation. You simply take your RNA polymerase, bang it into the promoter, and there goes translation. The product of this uh, particular device is, of course, a green fluorescent protein with plenty of glow effects for uh, good measure. So the BioBrick simulator is organized into a number of levels, and each level will have one or two new features. As this is the very first level, the only feature it has is, you know, your first translation, first transcription. When we get on to the second level, though, we've already complicated things by adding another new concept for students to wrap their heads around. We have the same basic setup as before, but you'll notice that this time, it's not enough to simply take my RNA polymerase and bring it to the promoter. This isn't causing the transcription as it was before. I've introduced a activator. This is an activatable promoter, and this is its activator protein, which is necessary for the transcription to occur. The activator in this case is a protein called C2. It exists in nature as a tetramer, but for uh, demonstration purposes, we're going to use it as a dimer today. What it does is it binds a promoter, and once it is bound, it acts as an activator. It allows an RNA polymerase that could not normally bind to this promoter site to bind afterwards, and then effectively turns the gene on, because the RNA polymerase can then connect when it's not lagging and flying off into the corners of the room. It can then connect and fulfill its job to produce protein. Once again, we've just got the same reporter protein that's green fluorescent protein. So each level will have a certain amount of guidance to uh, introduce the players to the new features. It may, it's obviously not fully obvious how a, uh, what one is supposed to do with an activator protein the first time they encounter it. But one good feature of this type of system is that it allows experimentation. Because the interactions are nice and simple, you can take any two parts and drag them together and see if there's an inter interaction there. And this will become very important in the later stages when there are a higher number of devices and systems and regulators and all sorts of elements, many of which will have interactions with each other. So I'm going to move on to level three now. Level three is quite similar to level two, except this time we're introducing a translational repressor. TET-R, another very familiar molecule for those in the synthetic biology or any molecular biology domain. So, the same system. We have a repressible promoter this time that is active in general. <clears throat> if we take TET-R and assemble it into a dimer, however, there it is. And then dock this dimer onto the promoter site Hey, get back here, you. There it goes. We will find that translation and transcription are no longer possible.
levels four and five continue on the same theme, except instead of providing the regulatory proteins right away, we now have two different devices and no proteins uh, evident except for the RNA polymerase. So the way this level works is we once again have an activatable promoter the same way as we did in the second level, but because we are not given the protein, we have to give the uh, user a different way to acquire it. So this is the first introduction of a gene that can regulate another gene. This biobrick device has an uncontrolled promoter, constitutive, simply for producing stay put you. Simply pr for producing C2 lambda. My complex is a little misformed this time, but it will work just as well as a nice spherical one. There it goes. I'm sorry, we do seem to be having a bit of lag today, which is why these objects are popping all over the place, but happily enough, they're still working well enough. And there we go, once, once again. The design of level five is quite similar. We have the same two parts, or the same two gene setup, except this one has been programmed to produce TET-R instead. I'm not going to run through this level because it's quite similar to the last one, but these two levels together illustrate the idea of one gene controlling another. And last of all, I'm going to finish with a more complicated system. This is a repressilator implemented in the Biobrick simulator. A repressil the idea behind a repressilator is you have three different genes. Each one regulates one of the others. Each one produces a repressor that acts on the next gene in the, in the uh, cycle. Because of the way the repressilator is built, the system never gets to a steady state. It never stops. In the previous systems, with um, one gene producing an activator all the time, and that activator acting on the other gene all the time, both genes are just on all the time. That's not the case with a repressilator. Ah, there it is. I'm going to go and produce the first repressor protein. Eventually, there it is. I'm going to dimerize them again, more or less, and bring them to the other, the promoter that TETR is responsible for regulating in the system. So now with the repressor in place, you've already seen how TETR works. The uh, RNA polymerase is not going to be able to produce this repressor, which means the repressor at the coded for at this site will be absent from the system, which means that the next gene, the next um, device in the system is not going to be repressed, will be on, will produce a repressor that's actually going to shut down the first one. So this is how the repressor works. Because no, there's always one gene that is at strong or always one device that is strongly activated, the next, the one it controls is strongly deactivated, and the result is that these roles alternate, and you get an oscillation. If you add a fourth device, as we have here, which is for producing GFP, you will see that the amount of GFP will oscillate with the system as, uh, at the same rate as this gene here's activation goes up and down with the end result being that your cells actually pulse, they glow on and off. 